Greetings fellow book lovers and welcome back to Colin's Corner. Today guys, I'm going to be doing something I don't usually do on my channel. I have done it a couple of times, uh, but I never got a review out for The Rainwilds Chronicles by Robin Hobb, and I would like to do that. Now, I didn't plan any of this. I'm just going to kind of go off the cuff and try to talk about what I remember sticking out to me. And uh, if I like this video, that means you guys are seeing it. If I don't like it, well then... No one's going to see it besides me because I didn't feel like putting it on the channel. But uh, anyways, before uh, I get into this review, I would like to go over the answer for the last Comedy with Colin segment that I did where I asked you guys to joke, where do New York City kids learn their multiplication tables? And many of you got this one, but the answer is Times Square. I know, a little goofy. Uh, that was maybe an easier one, but hey, I still love all of my jokes. And um, so where to begin? I think um, I, I'm a guy that is drawn to themes a lot. And I think from the very beginning of this book, we, the first book. So first of all, ah, I just dropped them all. This is gonna be a spoiler review. Um, Fully. So if you haven't read the Rain, Rain Wilds Chronicles yet, then I'm watch it if you want. Um, if you uh, have read it, then here are my thoughts. But anyways, the series starts with Dragon Keeper. Let's see if I can get these guys to focus. Cool. Next, the second book, we have Dragon Haven. These, by the way, are my favorite covers in the Realm of the Elderlings series. Uh, book three is City of Dragons. Of the U.S. editions, I would like to say. And the fourth and final book is Blood of Dragons. So, I've reviewed every other series in Realm of the Elderlings up to this point, and I felt like I needed to just kind of give you guys my thoughts on the Rainwilds Chronicles, because while it was my least favorite of the series, it wasn't... I did, I did really enjoy it, so... The first book in this series was, it was very obvious to me that there was a strong theme of, and I'm going to use a term that Philip uses a lot because I think that he puts it well, of othering. Um, the way I would put it is the like fear of other. Uh, and a lot of it is uh, in this abuse of power in some cases, but where we first start is we are in the Rainwilds in a town called uh, Trihog, I believe, or maybe it's Kasarik. I can't even remember where we started. I think it's Kasarik, actually. And we get to meet our main character, I think, for the first part of this series, which is Thymara. And in this Rainwilds society, uh, the children that are born with uh, heavy scaling and I want to say like dragon-like features uh, are in a very <laughs> archaic and maybe animalistic uh, way. They are almost just, they're supposed to be left out to die because where these people are living up in the trees and they're basically hunting and gathering, foraging for resources, uh, these these deformed children uh, typically die sooner and also can't grow up to provide anything for the society. They're takers only. And this is strictly looking at it from a life and death for the society's perspective. So Thymara was deformed. And her father went against society's guidelines, cultural recommendations, uh, and kept her and raised her and she is a fantastic hunter um, and helps her father gather and provide for their family and not, is not just a taker. So we get to know Thymara and uh, in, in Thymara and her relationship with her father kind of lead us into where we left off after 
the Live Ship Traders trilogy, which is what the bulk of the series is about, right? So we had Tintaglia taking the serpents upriver to nest and hope that they were going to survive. There was no guarantee. Um, so this was kind of the biggest thing I was, you know, excited to get to. And that's basically what the plot of this is about, is we, we get to see through Thymara and her father's eyes the hatching of these dragons. And it doesn't go well. It's horrible, actually. And it's this very tense, almost awkward event where everyone is kind of like you know, looking over to their, you know, neighbors and like, is this what this is supposed to look like? I don't think this is going that well. And uh, they were right. The dragons, a lot of them were coming out obviously deformed. Uh, Tintaglia's hopes were low that this was going to be successful, but low hopes are better than no hopes. So she tried to help them all as much as she could get uh with the slaves if you remember from live ship to get these dragons encased and um hopefully to hatch well they didn't spend enough time in the cocoons they didn't have enough saliva there wasn't enough dragons other than tentaglia to really help do this way it was supposed to be done so anyways the dragons come out and they are horribly deformed they cannot provide for themselves this is the massive part of uh really this whole plot is these dragons are now in the town of Kasarik just walking around because they can't fly, um, and a lot of them can't even walk around well. And they're destroying the land, utterly destroying the land, and they are massive, even though they're deformed, they are massive creatures that need a lot of food to sustain them. So what happened is that the town of Kasarik, the people in the town of Kasarik, uh, were left with no other option but to basically provide food for them. The people of the town had to hunt, gather food, feed the dragons to keep them happy, because if they weren't happy, they would throw tantrums and destroy stuff, because they were, although deformed, massive dragons. So, basically, this is where the whole, really, theme of the othering gets tied in for me, is, uh, the the traders council comes up with this genius idea where they figured out they can kill two birds quite literally what they think they're doing is killing two birds with one stone by gathering up all of the deformed youth adolescent people like thymara who do not provide in their eyes for the society and are just takers and basically rally them together and get them to to guide the dragons, who are also now just takers and ruining the entire area. The, the, the guides are supposed to guide the dragons to this, at this point in the series, mythical town of Kelsingra, where, you know, uh, it's written about in scrolls, it's not on any maps, people aren't sure if it exists. So essentially what the Traders' Council is doing is they set up this contract agreement with Captain Leftrin. He was going to captain the Tarmin and take all of these uh, keepers, is what they eventually become called, the dragon keepers. He's going to take the dragon keepers and guide the dragons up basically the Rainwilds River, looking for this town of Kelsingra. And so we get... You know, the contract, it looks juicy for the keepers, it looks juicy for Leftrin. Uh, and meanwhile, this entire time, the Traders' Council just literally thinks that the dragons are going to die and the keepers are not going to make it because they don't even know if this town exists. So they're really just trying to get rid of them. And so we have this journey over the course of at least the first two books where um, we, we see the dragons and the keepers basically building this relationship and it's based around the fact that they were both ostracized, that they were both kicked out of society, that they were both not wanted. And, um, you know, we start to get the dragon's perspective where, uh, if you've been reading Realm of the Elderlings up to this point, we know a little bit about the dragons. The dragons are very, um, they're very entitled. They think, they truly believe 
that humans are meant to basically serve them. And uh, so they feel very not great about being kicked out of Kasarik. And obviously they're kind of teed off that they came out deformed. Like they're not happy about that. Do you think they want to be fed by humans all the time and not be able to fly around and get what they want? And then we have the, the, the keepers who were ostracized from their families, from society, and anyone basically around the town of Kasarik that was not wanted there gets lumped into this group of people that are now keepers. And we get to see the keepers and the dragons build this relationship based around the fact that they are both othered, that they are both kicked out, and it's a beautiful thing to watch. Now, these keepers um, have no idea really anything about dragons. They're just kind of winging it. Everybody in this is just kind of winging it. They don't know if Kelsingra's real. Uh, they're scared of the dragons. All they try to do really is hunt as much as they can and feed the dragons as much as they can so that the dragons don't get pissed off. <laughs> but... In the process of all of this, and in the process of their travels, uh, the dragons end up picking individual keepers that they liked or that they connected with. And we get to see all of these beautiful relationships being built. We see commonalities um, of mind being you know, displayed between the dragons and the keepers where uh, I think they slowly all as a group start to realize nobody wanted us and nobody thinks that this is going to be successful we are basically being sent on a wild goose chase a wild goose chase that's going to end in us dying is what everybody thinks so that is kind of the uh, the binding uh the binding of of the dragons of the keepers and of the group and now obviously you know with a group traveling with younger kids and just a long you know kind of gross hard difficult trying journey we have lots of conflict along the way and i'm not going to get into all that i just want to kind of paint with broad strokes today um but it was really beautiful to see the dragons selecting certain keepers and the dragons teaching the keepers how to how to properly care for a dragon and the keepers learning how to properly care for a dragon and the dragon's mood changing and with the dragon's mood changing everybody's mood changed for the most part um, to more positive and so now they have this kind of rallying cry like everyone thinks we're gonna die everyone thinks this isn't going to be successful well let's prove them wrong let's get to Kelsingra screw it we're gonna try and so a lot of the first two books, specifically Dragon Keeper and Dragon Haven, um, they they are they are searching for Kelsingra. They have a general idea of where Kelsingra is, but don't know exactly. Um, and then eventually, we get to Kelsingra, right? And it was such a cool town because well, let me rewind for a little bit so we're getting closer to Kelsingra and obviously we have um the one of the keepers I'll mention here Tats uh I believe kind of irked people and was just I don't know just did stuff and he always used to get yelled at for it well he was the one that ends up making it to Kelsinger first. And there are some really cool tie-in moments between the Rainwilds Chronicles and the Farseer trilogy that I want to talk about, and previous books um, as well. But, you know, we have appearances from Malta, we have appearances from Rain, Kupris. Um, this, though, was probably my favorite thing. We get... Tats walking up a tower in Kelsingra, right? He's in Kelsingra, he's exploring. And he finds, if you remember all the way back to Farseer, Verity on his quest to find the stone dragons. We didn't know this at the time, but he had found Kelsingra. 
And he knew that Fitz and Ketrickin and that whole crew was trying to follow him, to find him, to help him, to make sure he didn't die. And anyways, Verity, in the top of some tower in Kelsingra, broke out a window. So you could see across the entire town. But he also set a small sheaf of papers on fire so that he could produce ashes, right? And when the crew of Fitz and everybody else follows in his footsteps and they find that same tower, um, Fitz goes up and he realizes, well, first of all, he's like, why would anybody just burn perfectly good paper? And then he realizes that it was Verity trying to send Fitz a sign by writing with ash on the wall. I'm pretty sure that's how it went. Well, Tats, when he's exploring Kelsinger for the first time, finds that tower, finds the ash written on the wall, knew somebody was there. And my heart was just so happy that like Robin Hobb had all these like little tie-ins. We get to see how much respect that Rain and Malta have earned now. I mean, they are just like revered members of the Rainwild Society. Um, but anyways, the Keepers eventually get to Kelsingra, and it's mainly Tats and a few of the first ones over there that start to figure out that this town of Kelsingra was an elderling town. The doorways and the uh, the courtyards were built in in mind of dragons, and so the keepers start to learn how to become elderlings. It's literally what they're doing, and so the plot of this entire series I thought was really really awesome. We start to learn some things about this series that we really didn't know. We learn a lot more about how dragons operate. We learn a lot more about how elderlings operated in conjunction with dragons. And we get an idea of how the world used to be when dragons ruled the land, the sea, and the sky. And we learn how the relationship between dragons and their keepers was how elderlings, I think, were created. Because the more time these keepers spend with their dragons, the dragons influence changes that these keepers go through, right? Physical changes that make them elderling-like. And so this entire journey, I thought, was amazing in, in, in that, hey, they were successful. Um, they made it to Kelsingra, and they, the the Traders Council, when Leftrin traveled back, because once they made it to Kelsingra, there was this whole thing where they had to get across this last river, and some of the dragons weren't strong enough to do it, and a lot of them were being pouty and not trying to learn how to fly. Well, some of the dragons eventually did learn how to fly. They all go over there, and there's healing waters in this city that they have awoken. The dragons start to grow. They start to get healthy. And the other dragons are like, I gotta get over there. So they eventually do. And once they're there, Leftrin goes back to the council to collect on the contract. And uh, they're like, nah, dude, like, you don't have any, like, there's no proof that, you know, you did this. And, and Leftrin's just like, fine, if you want to back out on your word, that's cool. You will never do business with me again. And we will be perfectly fine setting up a new establishment in Kelsingra and leaving you guys by the wayside because you screwed us over. So that gets the, you know, the council thinking, like, did they actually succeed? And all this political drama that was really, really cool. But, you know, overall, I thought it was awesome um, how this group of ragtag individuals and dragons that were not wanted banded together and they finally made it to Kelsingra. And we learned so much about this world called, the, this world in this series called Realm of the Elderlings. Well, it took... Till the Rainwilds Chronicles to learn a lot about the Elderlings, and man, were they really cool people! And to kind of see how the these these keepers become Elderlings, and how they served dragons, and you know the the keepers are using memory stones and and memories to access how the Elderlings operated, what tricks and secrets they used, and 
I really enjoyed this overall. The reason that this was my least favorite subseries in the realm of the Elderlings so far is that I did not really connect with a lot of the characters. I thought that the plot of the Raymods Chronicles was awesome. Uh, I loved following the dragons. I loved following the keepers. I loved following along with the Tarman and Leftrin. And this whole journey I thought was awesome. It is thunderstorming right now, so if you guys end up hearing this on the mic, I apologize. It just is what it is. But anyways, I, I didn't connect with not a single character even closely as much as I did with Fitz or a lot of the other characters in Live Ship Traders. Um, a lot of people say that this series feels YA. I kind of get why. Another one of my less favorite parts of this was that there was a lot of like adolescent uh, love triangly drama stuff going on in the background and it wasn't that prominent so it didn't ruin the experience for me but I tired of it very quickly. And I just personally did not connect with this set of characters a lot. The first book, not at all. I was not that excited until the second book. And the second book, my enjoyment grew because I, there started to be a, a couple little tie-ins to previous series, and that made me happy. Um, this series was extremely well written. And by saying it was my least favorite, I'm not saying that I didn't like it. I liked it a lot. I really enjoyed it. It's just my least favorite in the subseries sets of Realm of the Elder Links so far. Um, you know, the dragons helped to uh, get Selden back. Selden was used again for being uh, other and uh, rescued him from Chalcid and uh, basically attacked the Chalcidians. That was awesome. Um, and they're setting up their little the little community in Kelsingra and um, I don't know if any of this gets touched on in Fits in the Fool, what's going on in this part of the world. Um, I hope it does because the dragons are growing and getting stronger and they're going to be a prominent part of the world again. And so I think that's obviously going to have a massive effect on the six duchies and everything else going on everywhere because they just still think, I think, that there's only, like, one dragon. And that part of the world, a lot of people think that dragons are still a myth. They don't even know that they're, you know, alive and growing and reproducing. So I hope that these converge at some point in Fits in the Fool. Um, I don't know if they're going to or not, but uh, that was kind of the whole... The whole point of Fitz and the Fool's relationship was to, uh, you know, as, as the Fool said it, was to, Fitz was the catalyst to bring change to the world, and that change was that, you know, it was to bring dragons back into the world. So, Fitz doesn't really seem that concerned, I, I don't think, with whether there are dragons or not, and whether everything that they did was for nothing or for something, but... Hopefully they get a payoff and we get some kind of convergence between the Ramos Chronicles and the Fitz in the full. Um, I think that's going to just about do it. I'm, I'm, I'm veering towards rambling and this whole thing might have been rambling. I don't really know, but I wanted to get a review out some thoughts on just the Rainwilds Chronicles in general. If you guys have read the Rainwilds Chronicles, let me know what you think of my thoughts in the comments, what your thoughts were on the Rainwilds Chronicles where it falls in the ranking of things for you. Um, I know that my partner that I've been reading this series with, Ben from Books with Bengus Khan, he loved this series. I think he liked it a lot more than I did. So again, I'm not saying at all that it's bad. I think it clicks with different people differently. And for me, uh, I think I've just discovered that I, I click absolutely the most with Fitz as a character and the Fitz storyline and the Fitz characters rather than the other ones, but I still love the other series and the other characters, just not as much. So, I don't know, those are my thoughts on Robin Hobbs, The Rainwatch Chronicles as a whole, and before we go today, we have to do this video's comedy with Colin. Today's joke, I think a lot of you are probably going to get this one too, but I liked it, was what do you call an injured Batman? If you think you know the answer, add it to your comment below. Guys, thank you so incredibly much for watching, sticking with me. 
If you're new to the channel, please don't forget to like the video, subscribe so you can follow through my journey of the rest of the realm of the Elderlings, and also my journey through other fantastical worlds. Uh, we would love to have you. I hope you guys are all enjoying what you're currently reading, and remember, you're always welcome in Colin's Corner.